All right, this is Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. It's the modern library version, so it's actually got some library stamps in the back. Totally vintage, totally cool. Um, we're on chapter five. Chapter five is called The Doctor's Worries. Chapter 5, The Doctor's Worries. What name can one give it? Frustration? Depression? When melancholy sets in, a kind of invisible but thick and heavy fog invades the heart, envelops the body, constricting its very core. All we feel is this constriction, this haze around us. We don't even understand at first what it is that grips us. This was what Vera Kornilyevna felt as she finished her rounds and went down the stairs with Donsova. She was very upset. In such circumstances, it helps to take stock of oneself and consider what it's all about, to put something up as a protective barrier too. But there wasn't time for her to take stock. This was the position. She was anxious about mother. This was what the three radiotherapy interns called Ludmila Afanseyevna among themselves. She was like a mother to them, partly because of her age. They were all about 30, while she was nearly 50, and partly because of the special zeal with which she taught them to work. She herself was keen to the point of being obsessed, and she wanted all her three daughters to absorb that same keenness and obsession. She was among the last of the school of doctors with a grasp of x-ray diagnosis as well as x-ray therapy. For some time, there had been a general trend toward fragmentation of knowledge. But in spite of this, she tried to make her interns keep up with both. She had no secrets. There was nothing she kept to herself and would not share. And uh, when Gangart occasionally showed herself sharper and quicker than her mother, Ludmila Afanseyevna, was only too pleased. Vera had worked with her for eight years, ever since leaving medical college and all the power she felt she now possessed, the power to pull back from creeping death those who came and implored her to save them. Every atom of it came from her contact with Ludmila Afanasyevna. That is the correct pronunciation. I hope I was saying that yesterday. This fellow, Rusonov, might turn out to be a tedious nuisance to mother her. Only a magician can fix a head on a body but any fool can lob it off. How she wished there was only one Rusanov, her. Any patient with bitterness in his heart was capable of behaving like this. And when hounds are in full cry, you cannot just call them off at will. These threats left not a footprint on water, but a furrow in the mind. A furrow can always be leveled and filled with sand, but if any drunken huntsman shouts, down with doctors, or down with engineers. There's always a hunting crop to hand. The black clouds of suspicion gathered once over the white coats. There's an asterisk on white coats. A further allusion to the doctor's plot. I'm going to have to look that up. I think it's a, a historical thing. Had left shreds behind hovering here and there. Quite recently, in MGB, two asterisks, the Ministry of State Security, the organization now known as the KGB, the Committee for State Security, quite recently, an MGB chauffeur had been admitted to the clinic with a stomach tumor. He was a surgical case. Vera Kornelievna had had nothing to do with him, except that once when she was on night duty, making her evening rounds, he had complained to her of sleeping badly. She had prescribed bromurol. 
bromurol. However, the sister told her only small doses were available, so she had said, give him two powders and one dose. The patient took them from her, and Vera Kornilyevna never noticed the peculiar way he looked at her. And no one would have known if one of the girl laboratory assistants hadn't been living in the same flat as the chauffeur and come to visit him in the ward. She came running to Vera Kornilyevna in great excitement. The chauffeur had not taken the powders. Why were there two together? He'd lain awake all night, and now he was questioning the assistant. Why is her last name Gangart? Tell me more about her. She tried to poison me. We'd better check up on her. Vera spent several weeks waiting to be checked up on, several weeks of having to make her diagnoses confidently, impeccably, with inspiration even, of measuring doses accurately, of encouraging her patients with glances and smiles to make up for their finding themselves inside this notorious cancer circle, and all the time expecting one of them to look at her as if to say, are you a poisoner? Another reason why today's round had been particularly difficult was that Kostoglatov, a patient who had made especially good progress and whom Vera Kornilyevna had for some reason treated with particular kindness, had made a point of questioning mother in that very manner, suspecting that some wicked experiment was being practiced on him. Ludmila Afanasyevna was also thoroughly depressed as she finished her rounds. She remembered the unpleasant business there had been over Polina Zavashikova, that prize troublemaker. It wasn't she who had been ill, but her son. She had come in to the clinic just to be with him. They operated and removed an internal tumor and she fell upon the surgeon in the corridor demanding a piece of her son's tumor. If it had not been for Lev Leonidovich, she might, well, have got it. Her plan was to take the piece to another clinic to have the diagnosis confirmed, and if it hadn't agreed with Dontsova's diagnosis, she had demanded money or taken them to court. Every member of the hospital staff could remember some similar incident. Now that the rounds were over, they were on their way to discuss among themselves what they couldn't talk about in front of the patients and to take decisions. Rooms were scarce in the cancer wing, and there was not even a small one to be found for the radiotherapists. There was no accommodation for them either in the gamma gun unit, or in the unit with the long focus 120,000 and 200,000 volt x-ray installations. There was a room in the x-ray diagnosis unit, but it was always dark in there, so they had to make do with a table in the near-focus x-ray unit. It was here they dealt with their daily problems and wrote out their case histories, as if it wasn't enough to have to spend years working in the nauseating x-ray filled air with its peculiar smell and heat. They had to do their writing in it, too. They came in and sat down beside each other at the large rough-surfaced table that had no drawers. Vera Kornilyevna flipped through the inpatient's cards, the women's and the men's, dividing them into cases she would deal with herself and cases they would have to decide about together. Ludmila Afanasyevna looked gloomily down at the table, tapping it with her pencil. Her lower lip stuck out slightly. Vera Kornilyevna looked at her sympathetically, but could not make up her mind to speak either about Rusonov or Kostoglatov, or about the lot of doctors in general, because there was no sense in repeating what they all knew. She would have to be subtle and choose her words carefully, otherwise she might hurt her instead of consoling her. Ludmila Afonseevna spoke, It's infuriating, isn't it? Her pow how powerless we are. This could be said of many of the patients examined that day. She started tapping her pencil again. Of course, there's been no mistake on our side. 
This can apply to either Azovkin or Mursolimov. We were a bit out in one of our four diagnoses, but we gave the right treatment. We couldn't have given a smaller dose. It was that barrel that finished us. Ah, uh, yes, she was thinking about Sebgatov. There are some thankless cases on which you spend three times your usual ingenuity and still can't save the patient. When Sibgatov was first carried in on a stretcher, the x-rays showed destruction of almost the entire sacrum. The error had been in establishing a bone sarcoma, even though they had consulted a professor. Only later did it gradually emerge that the trouble was caused by a large-celled tumor, which makes fluid appear in the bone and transforms it into a jelly-like tissue. Still, the treatment in both cases was the same. The sacrum could not be removed or sawn out. It is in the cornerstone of the body. The only thing left was x-ray therapy, which had to be immediate and in large doses. Small ones would not be any good. And Sibgatov got better. The sacrum strengthened. He recovered, but the doses he'd been given were large enough for a horse, and the surrounding tissue became excessively sensitive, developing a tendency to form new malignant tumors. Now, his blood and tissue were refusing to respond to radiotherapy. A new tumor was raging, and nothing could be done to defeat it. It could only be contained. For the doctor, this meant a sense of helplessness, a feeling that the methods used were not yet effective. A heartfelt pity, simple, ordinary pity. There was Sibgatov, a gentle, well-mannered, mournful Tartar, so ready with his gratitude, and all that could be done for him was to prolong his suffering. This morning, Nizamuddin Baromovich had summoned Donsova for a special reason, to increase the turnover of beds. In all doubtful cases where there was no assurance of improvement, the patient was to be discharged. Donsova agreed with this. There was a constant line of applicants for admission sitting in the waiting room, sometimes for days on end, and requests were always coming in from provincial cancer clinics asking permission to send patients. She agreed in principle, and there was no one who came so obviously within this category as Sibgatov, but she was incapable of discharging him. The struggle for this single sacrum had been too long and too exhausting. At this point, she could not yield to a simple, reasonable suggestion or give up going through the motions. However faint, the hope was that death, not the doctor, would be the one to make that error. Sibgatov had even caused a change in Donsova's scientific interest. She had become absorbed in the pathology of bones for one reason only, to save him. There might well be patients waiting with equally pressing claims but even so, she couldn't let go of Sibgatov. She was ready to use all her cunning with the senior doctor to protect him. Nizamutin Baromovich insisted, too, on discharging those who were doomed. So far as possible, their deaths should occur outside the clinic. This would increase the turnover of beds. It would also be less depressing for those who remained, and it would help the statistics because the patient's discharge would be listed not as deaths, but as deteriorations. Azovkin fell into this category and was to be discharged today. Over the months, his case history had become a thick book made of sheets of coarse brown paper all stuck together. In the paper were tiny, whitish flecks of wood that made the pen stick as lines and figures were entered in violet and blue ink. Behind this sheaf of papers, both doctors saw a town-raised boy, sweating with pain, sitting doubled up on his bed. However, quietly and softly, the figures were read out. They were more inexorable than the thunderings of a court-martial, and against them there was no appeal. There were 26,000 rads in him, of which 12,000 were from his last series. He'd had 50 injections of Sinestrol, seven blood transfusions, in spite of which 
there were still only 3,400 white corpuscles. And as for the red, the secondaries were tearing his defense to pieces, like tanks. They were hardening the thoracic wall and appearing in the lungs, inflaming the nodes over the collarbones. The organism was providing no reinforcements, nothing to stop their advance. The doctors were still flipping through the cards, finishing those they had earlier laid aside. An x-ray laboratory nurse continued treating the outpatients. Just now, she had a four-year-old girl in the little blue dress in there with her mother. The little girl's face was covered with red vascular swellings. They were still small and non-malignant, but it was normal to treat these with radiotherapy to stop them degenerating into malignancy. The little girl herself couldn't care less. She had no idea that on her tiny lip she might already be bearing the heavy mask of death. It was not the first time she'd been there, and she lost her fear. She chattered like a bird, stretching out her hands to the nickel-plated parts of the apparatus and enjoying the shiny world around her. Her whole session took only three minutes, but she had no desire at all to spend them sitting motionless under the narrow tube, precisely pointed at the sore places. She kept extricating herself and turning away. The x-ray technician grew nervous, switched off the current and re-aimed the tube at her again and again. Her mother held out a toy to attract her attention and promised her more presence if she would only sit still. Then a gloomy old woman came in and spent ages unwinding her scarf and taking off her jacket. She was followed by a woman inpatient wearing a gray dressing gown with a little spherical pigmented tumor on the sole of her foot. All that had happened was that a nail in her shoe had pricked her. She was talking merrily away to the nurse, little realizing that this tiny ball, no more than a centimeter wide, was the very queen of malignant tumors, a melanoblastoma, a melanoblastoma, or melanoblastoma, I don't know. I'm going to go with melanoblastoma. A melanoblastoma, whether they liked it or not, the doctors had to spend time on these patients as well. They examined them and advised the nurse. And so, by now it was long past the time when Vera Kornilyevna was supposed to give Rusanov his embiquin injection. She took out the last card and laid it in front of Ludmila Afanasyevna. It was one she'd been purposely holding back, Kostoglatov's. It's an appallingly neglected case, she said, but our treatment has got off to a brilliant start, only he's a very obstinate man. I'm afraid he really may refuse to go on with it. Just let him try, Ludmila Afansievna brought her hand down on the table. Kostoglatov's disease is the same as Azovkin's. The only difference is that his treatment seems to be working. How dare he refuse it? He won't dare with you, Gangart once agreed, but I'm not sure I can outdo him in obstinacy. Can I send him to see you? She was scratching off some bits of fluff that had stuck to her fingernail. Our relations are a bit difficult at the moment. I can't seem to manage to speak to him with any authority. I don't know why. Their relations had been difficult ever since the first time they met. There's now a blank space with three asterisks. And there is nothing down here to tell me what that means. Okay. It was an overcast January day. Oh, that must mean like the starting of a new thing. So the, the relations have been difficult ever since they first met. Okay, so this is probably like a, a flashback to when they just met. It was an overcast January day, and the rain was pouring down. Gangart had just begun her night as a doctor on duty in the clinic. At about nine o'clock, the fat, healthy-looking main floor, orderly, came to see her with a complaint. Doctor, one of the patients is making a scene. I can't cope with him anymore on my own. If something isn't done, they'll all be round our necks. 
Vera Kornilyevna went outside and saw there was a man lying on the floor right by the locked door of the matron's dark little office by the main staircase. He was a lanky fellow dressed in a pair of high boots, a soldier's faded green coat, and a civilian fur hat with ear flaps. It was too small for him, but he'd managed to pull it on. There was a duffel bag under his head, and he was evidently about to go to sleep. Gengart walked right up to him, her well-shaped legs tapering down to a pair of high-heeled shoes. She never dressed carelessly, and looked at him severely, trying to shame him with her stare and make him get up. But although he saw her, he looked back at her quite unconcernedly. He didn't move an inch. In fact, it looked as if he'd even closed his eyes. Who are you? she asked him. A human being, he answered quietly, unperturbed. Do you have an admission card? Yes. When did you get it? Today. The marks on the floor beside him showed that his coat must be wet through. So must his boots and his duffel bag. Well, you can't lie here. It's, it's not allowed. Besides, it's not seemly. It's seemly enough, he answered faintly. This is my country. Why should I be ashamed? Vera Kornelyevna was confused. She felt she couldn't possibly shout at him and order him to get up, and anyway, it wouldn't have had any effect. She cast a look in the direction of the waiting room. During the day, it was crowded with visitors and people waiting. There were usually three garden benches for relatives to use as they talked to patients. But at night, when the clinic was locked up, people had come a long way and had nowhere to go were put up in there. There were only two benches in there at the moment. An old woman was lying on one of them and a young Uzbek woman in a colorful scarf had laid her child on the other and was sitting beside it. She could permit him to lie on the waiting room floor, but it was covered with mud from all the shoes that had trodden on it, and on this side of the glass everything had been sterilized, and anyone who came here had to wear hospital dress or white coats. Once again, Vera Kornilyevna glanced at this wild-looking patient. His sharp, emaciated face already registered the indifference of death. There's no one in town you can go to? No. Have you tried the hotels? Yes, I've tried. He was tired by now of answering her. There are five hotels here. They wouldn't even listen to me. He closed his eyes as if to indicate that the audience was over. If only he'd come earlier, thought Gangart. Some of our nurses let patients stay the night at their homes. They don't charge much. He lay there with his eyes closed. He says, I don't mind if I have to lie here a week. The duty orderly went into the attack. Right in everyone's way, until they give me a bed, he says. It's disgraceful. Get up. Stop playing the fool. This floor's been sterilized. The orderly advanced upon him. Why are there only two benches? Wasn't there a third? Said Gangart with surprise in her voice. There. They moved the third one over there. The orderly pointed out through the glass door. It was true. One bench had been taken into the corridor leading to the apparatus room. It was now used for the outpatients to sit on when they came for their sessions during the day. Vera Kornelyevna told the orderly to unlock the door to the corridor. She said to the sick man, I'll move you somewhere more comfortable. Please get up. He looked at her suspiciously at first, then tormented and twitching with pain. He started to rise to his feet. It was obvious that every moment, every turn of his body was an effort. He got up, but left his duffel bag lying on the floor. It would be too painful for him to bend down and pick it up now. Vera Kornelyevna bent down easily, 
With her white fingers, she picked up the dirty, soaking wet duffel bag and gave it to him. Thank you. He gave her a crooked smile. Things have come to a pretty pass. There was a damp, oblong stain on the floor where he had been lying. You've been in the rain. She gazed at him sympathetically. Take off your coat. It's warm in, in there in the corridor. You aren't feverish. You don't have a temperature. His forehead was completely covered by the wretched tight black hat, its fur flaps hanging, so she laid her fingers on his cheek instead. One touch was enough to tell that he did have a temperature. Are you taking anything? The look he gave her was rather different this time. It did not express such utter alienation. Aniline. Analgin. Have you any? Um, shall I bring you some sleeping pills? If you can. Oh, yes, she remembered suddenly. Can I see your admission card? Perhaps, he smiled, or perhaps his lips moved in obedience to some spasm of pain. If I don't have the paper, it's back out in the rain. Is, is that it? He undid the top hooks on his great coat and pulled the card from the pocket of the army shirt that showed underneath. It actually had been issued that morning in the outpatient's department. She looked at it. He was one of her patients, a radiotherapy patient. She took the card and went off to get the sleeping pills. I'll go and get them now. Come and lie down. Wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. He suddenly came to life. Give me back that paper. I know these tricks. What are you afraid of? She turned round, offended. Don't you trust me? He looked at her doubtfully and grunted. Why should I trust you? You and I haven't drunk from the same bowl of soup. He went and lay down. Suddenly she was annoyed. She didn't come back to see him. Instead, she sent an orderly with the sleeping pills and the admission card. She wrote urgent at the top of the card, underlined it, and put an exclamation mark. It was night when next she came past him. He was asleep. The bench was quite good for sleeping on. He couldn't fall off it. The curved back formed a half trough with the curve of the seat. He had taken off his wet coat, but he'd spread it out on top of him, one side over his legs and the other over his shoulders. The soles of his boots hung over the edge of the bench. There wasn't a single sound inch on them. They were patched all over with bits of black and red leather. There were metal caps on the toes and small horseshoes on the heels. In the morning, Vera Kornilyevna mentioned him to the matron, who then put him on the upper landing. After that first day, Kostogotov had never been rude to Gangart again. When he spoke to her, it was politely and in his normal, urbane manner. He was the first to say good morning and would even greet her with a friendly smile. But she always had the feeling that he might do something a bit strange. And sure enough, the day before yesterday, she'd summoned him for a test to determine his blood group. She prepared an empty syringe to take blood from his vein, and immediately he rolled down his sleeve again and announced firmly, I'm very sorry, Vera Kornilyevna, but you'll have to get along without the sample. For goodness sake, why? They've drunk enough of my blood already. I don't want to give you any more. Someone else can give it, someone who's got plenty of blood. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're a man, aren't you? She looked at him with the well-known feminine mockery that men cannot endure. I'll only take three cubic centimeters. Three cc's! What do you need it for? We'll determine your blood group with a compatibility reaction, and if we have the right kind of blood, we'll give you 250 cc's. Me? Blood transfusion? God forbid! What do I need someone else's blood for? I don't want anyone else's, and I'm not giving a drop of my own. Make a note of my blood group. I remember it from the war. 
when I was at the front, and nothing she said would change his mind. He refused to give way, finding the new and unexpected arguments. He was convinced it was all a waste of time. At long last, she took offense. You're putting me in a stupid, ludicrous position. For the last time, please. Of course, it was a mistake on her part to humiliate herself like that. Why should she do the pleading? But he instantly bared his arm and held it out. All right, but only for you. You may take three cc's. In fact, she felt ill at ease with him. And one day, something funny happened. Kostoglatov said, You don't look like a German. You must have taken your husband's name. Yes, the word fell involuntarily from her lips. Why had she said that? Because at the time, it would have hurt to say anything else. He didn't ask her anything more. In fact, Gengart had been her father's and her grandfather's name. They were Russianized Germans. But what should she have said? I'm not married. I've never been married. Out of the question. And that concludes chapter five. Um, so yeah, some flashbacks occurring here. I guess this is how Kostoglatov met Gangart. And, uh, pretty, uh, pretty cool way. I'm assu I mean, from what it sounds like to me, he literally just, like, crawled in from Siberia and fell to the floor, which might be actually what happened. I don't know. I guess we'll have to find out in Chapter 6, which I'll read Sunday. Yeah, by the way, let me address this. I totally forgot that yesterday was Wednesday and that today was Thursday. So I thought today was Friday, but that's tomorrow, so I'll be back Sunday at 9 p.m. Uh, thank you for listening, and make sure to follow the Periscope. Um, I'm looking at getting a way to hook up, like, actual legitimate equipment to Periscope. I think it's possible to go over, like, a frequency of Bluetooth or something like that. Got to do some research, but when I do that, it will be a lot easier to listen to on Periscope. Anyway, thanks again for listening. I'm Carter Banks. Uh, this is Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And if you want to hear Chapter 6, tune in Sunday night at 9 p.m. Central Time. Thanks again, and uh, have a safe weekend. Night, dude. Oh, shit. I don't know what I just did with the Instagram, but I think I paused it. Oh yeah, I gotta end it.